Hello there everyone and welcome to Tiano the Losses of Europe. I'm your host, Mr. Mocha Lover, in which we are beginning a new campaign, playing as Tomsk, of course, with the Toolbox 3 update. But if you'd like to read about the Central Siberian Republic, please go right ahead, as we will begin reading about Passing on the Torch. The prisoner walked the halls of the presidential palace alone at this late hour. None walked with him but his memories, echoes of a better time. Pale moonlight drifted through the curtains of clouds in the sky, beaming through the hallway's grand, grand windows. Once, the Central Siberian Republic stood as one of the strongest successor states to the Soviet Union. In inheriting a wealth of industry from Bukharin's Siberian plan, the government in Tomsk set to work for building a new Russia, one where the citizens would be free to prosper and free to give their opinions and governance. Yet the Russian anarchy could not spare Central Siberia, landlocked and surrounded by hostile governments and warlords. The beginning of the Republic's end had come in from secessionists in Novosibirsk. Then, the Agoda's accursed Soviet Union remnants had launched an Kotsik uh, invasion. Both nations uh, had bled, been bled to death. As children weeping as war and famine came to a once peaceful land in central Siberia, various provisional governors rose against a fatally weakened central government. Rogue military officers have blamed the civilian government for their own failures to put out the anarchists and secessionists one by one. Provinces seceded, only to Omsk remain. The cold tugged at Pasternak's energy, almost as much as the darn disease did. The door to his office, wooden and regal, felt a little heavier every day, but the president was not about to throw in the towel just yet. The CSR's old government had failed. Tom's current provisional government would not rule inter eternally. Pasternak felt he and his generation had gotten the Republic in this mess. The least they could do was do their best to give the next generation the torch. In the sleeping city surrounding the presidential palace, workers and poets, soldiers and politicians, all of the Republic's remaining children slept. All the president had to do, alone in his office as usual, was entrust the future to them. So much work to do, so little time. Pasternak chuckled. It wouldn't be long before he had all the sleep he needed anyhow. To the, new, to the next generation, new generation, from falling hands. For failing hands. Oh, so we also have uh, the Tomsk Duma. The modern December society, like its ancient forebears, has long looked to the West for constitutional developments. Popularly elected legislatures, or popularly elected legislatures, are too easily swayed by populism and de demagoguery. Whereas appointed legislators are callous and distant from the common man, as such, the Decembers have modeled their Duma on a bicameral model. A lower house elected by the people is able to propose laws that are then analyzed by appointed upper house. The upper house's powers are constrained, and its members are some of the Republic's most respected citizens from all political origins. Now, I've played as Tom's before. I went with Shostakovich and played as a humanist, which was tremendous. I loved that path so much. It's probably one of the earliest paths I did in TNO. Also, we have a cup of coffee to keep us nice and warm, but uh, I'm not sure which way we're going to go. We mm, not really. Ooh, is that still a triple clef? It is, huh? I might still just go December, so we'll see what happens. Um, we don't have enough political power. Uh, the current ruling party is not conservative democracy, anyways, so. And up here. What's the ruling party? Bastelards? Oh, Bastelards are, huh? Alright, cool. Consolidate rule. We can Bastelard authority. Nice. We'll see what happens. Um, I just don't want to go humanist again, but yeah. Uh, we're a year away from Wolin. When a provisional leader, Boris Pasternak, decided on his experiment to form a new society of intellectuals in the depths of Siberia, little did he know how far it would get. The Republic itself found uh, as a bastion as democratic tradition, as it became surrounded by tyrants, sometimes coated in red paint, sometimes not. Even the writer president himself was soon overwhelmed by the task of guiding the nation through storm after storm. Now in his 70s, Pasternak is an old and fragile man, yet at no point did he lose the respect of his followers, fellow artists, or scientists. Being sick, he's enclosed himself in the presidential residence, writing whether that is proposed laws or acts, or creative texts of his own. The people who have surrounded him are the very best, and have played an increasingly significant role in governing. But everyone knows that when the days of our leaders are numbered, when that time comes, we must be ready and continue his legacy. And the Provisional Government. The Provisional Government, located in the only major city he still had control over, was formed by a circle of the President's close friends and associates. Only the most loyal, who in many cases even had followed him in his journey eastwards back in the days of the war, were allowed to participate. The Provisional Government, in his years in power, has thankfully managed to stay above the bickering between different factions and salons, paving the way to a constitution and true democracy. With its inevitable passing coming closer and closer, Pasternak has made his clear wish for the Republic. This government's goal has been fulfilled, and a smooth transition to the intended system is ensured. Thus, and except his elections, where the voices of the people will be heard, it is time uh, to finally begin the process of disbanding this authority. And of course, we're going to scavenge for loot like normal. Propose a military program. Oh, that's kind of cool. Hover over mouse on the state Duma members to check the salon support. Modernization. Oh, sounds like good. Sounds good. Sounds like fun. Ah, oh, clear that one. Scan for loot. Central Siberian expansion. Winter's over, and the spring Rasputitsa has ended. Has lower house majority. Huh. Of course, we can do a whole bunch of raiding here eventually, too. Ooh. We just need more command power. God dang, we only have five. Oh. Legacy of the Siberian plan. I forget about this stuff, too. Um. This stuff is not bad, but still. I don't know how bad the rubble system here is for Tom's cool. We'll see. The years of steel, the years of ashes. 
It's an entirely unproductive day. These have been a rarity in the present and past of long and eventful life. Now the toll of illness and age were making such days a much more common occurrence. Boris Pasternak had thus spent the day reminiscing as he spent in his... As he rested in his bedroom. He had emerged as one of the early leaders of the old Central Siberian Republic. Things had never been easier, evident. Some wanted a continuation of Bukharin's old Soviet Union. Others in the army preferred a much more authoritarian type of government. A permanent military emergency until the nation could be reunited, but Pasternak and his allies had appealed to the intellectuals of Tomsk. Those who dreamed of a freer future, they had also appealed to the common man, promising to the worker prosperity in return for their help. Now, the president found himself a leader of a much reduced republic, and its democracy temporarily suspended by a provisional government. Its economy in shambles. Time has made a mockery of these early plans. Pasternak had been surprised to see the republic back as a continuation as emergency provisional president. Had he not embodied everything that had gone wrong with the CSR, yet the people in Tomsk had somehow kept their trust in him. Even the workers dutifully continued their shifts in the great industrial works after having backed the provisional government in a referendum. The food situation was not excellent, but it was at least stable. Perhaps none among the poor or the elite wished to chance another leader in these most dangerous of times. General Shapshnikov had ensured the loyalty of the Rump Army to civilian institutions. The president felt a bit humbled by the trust shown to him. He also knew that his people expected much in return. This did not worry him unduly. His final project would soon be presented in Tomsk leadership, just as Pasternak had put his affairs in order before his passing, so too would the Republic's affairs be arranged. A reading of his political last wills was in order for the first draft. Even though he knows that his provisional rule shall not last much longer, the president is willing to do anything for the democracy he has built in central Siberia. From his lavishly decorated house, and with the help of his advisors, he has begun writing the foundations of a document to lead the country into the future. That document is the Constitution. The Constitution is of the utmost importance for a state such as ours. Pasternak has only been left with one job to do, and is that to show the intellectuals and the salons the path to, to their dream through a simple manuscript. He has based it on everything from the laws and ideals of short-lived Rus Republican Russia to the constitutions of the Western world. Freedoms and liberties and expression and religion shall be protected, while the people will elect the representatives. It is more than certain that any successor to him will take Pasternak's first draft and sculpt it into a proper constitution for the years to come. Oh, look at that stuff. The Petrov Salon. Morning, Duma. As he did every morning, Anatoly Petrov prepared himself as he entered the kitchen. Having just turned 18, he had an announcement that he wanted to make to his family, but he knew his, he would have to force an opportunity to do so, because breakfast in the Petrov household was no simple or quiet matter. As expected, his father and sister were already arguing. His father, who had worked in the Tomsk industrial yards all his life, had long aligned himself behind the Bastillards, while his sister, having just entered the university for economic studies, had embraced the modernist and the technocratic principles. Bitter arguments ensured over every, if, every issue. <clears throat> His mother subscribed to the conservative viewpoints of the Decembrists in the interest of stability and to try to keep the peace besides. As for Anatoly himself, he found himself immediately entranced by the fundamentally constructive ideals of Shostakovich's humanists. It seemed only natural to him that the only way forward for people and a nation was that of collective cooperation, which is why his decision had, in truth, not been much of one of all. As his mother placed his food in front of him, he interrupted his father and sister and made his announcement. He had enlisted in the Republic's army and will be departing next week for training. This normally lively atmosphere of the Petrov breakfast immediately fell silent, and Anatoly could see that while his father intrinsically understood the duty his son felt, his mother and sister could not. He prepared himself for a very long morning indeed. In the end, however, he knew he would not be deterred. President Pasternak was always talking about how one had to be willing to work, willing to risk, to stand up and make life better for all. Anatoly intended to do just that. A family as diverse as the Republic itself, and lullabies for the Old West. Another glass of vodka the older man offered. Moisey accepted with an odd. He had long given up encouraging his friend and mentor to quit drinking. It was always sad in him to see the old composer reduced to health. No one was spared by time. After all, both friends... <clears throat> Toasted to their old homes in the west, to the streets of St. Petersburg, to the alleyways of Warsaw. Both lost to the years, fascist jackboots keeping them drowning in the ebbs of time until even the memories were dissolved. The two friends did not particularly enjoy musing on painful memories, yet the fall of Europe cast their shadow on both musicians' lives to the tragedy of Dmitry Shostakovich could find echo in the more recent catastrophe of the destruction of the Central Siberian Republic. A nation of hope and progress, crushed by militarism, its corpse embalmed by faceless bureaucrats and kept on display. What's there to be done? asked Moisey. His mentor gazed into the distance, absentmindedly pushing back up his glasses. Finally, the old composer spoke. I've... I've been discussing with fellows of the humanist salon. I will run for presidency. Anticipating his friend's objection, Shostakovich lifted his hand. Ironic, isn't it? Even as the old Pasternak has a foot in the tomb, I stand in line behind him with my own poor health. Yet, something must be done. The president is a good man, and his call for election was the right one. I'm afraid, Moisey. So many candidates running, none of them understand why their old republic failed. Everyone has solutions to be implemented, top down, orders, and instructions for poor workers. But who will listen? Who will cherish a conch man, the elite so called equals, their brothers and sisters? The old CSR doesn't, didn't listen to the men in Altai Novosibirsk, to the anarchists, to the poor and the hungry. I, I'd like to try to do something about it, Moisey. After a life of just being a victim of events, I. Shostakovich fell silent. 
The young musician put his hand on his mentor's. It's never too late to try to meet you now. How about we honor the bottle? A final time for the day. The older man smiled and nodded. They drank to the future for once, and changing the guard. All eyes turned to him when he entered the room. Concern, sorrow, and pity, a mixture of emotions was evident in the assembled visages. The president was used if you want, uh, used to seeing the progression of his cancer on the faces of those who he did not even meet often. If you wonder about the modern bogatier, though, please go ahead. The men were from a range of backgrounds, industrialists, academics, bureaucrats of the provisional government. A few outsiders stood awkwardly next to the general Shapshnikov. The trusty general had followed Pasternak's directives. The president nodded gratefully at his old friend. The general saluted crisply. Pasternak began speaking. Gentlemen, my time is probably more limited than yours even. A few awkward laughs, Pasternak continued. I've gathered you today to express my thoughts on the provisional government. I think none of us are particularly satisfied with its progress. A few nods of assent. What was supposed to be a temporary measure to trim the old apparatus of the CSR, recalibrate our economy, and tend to our dismal army or diminished army has now been stretched in months and years of sluggish progress. Political opposition has rightfully pointed out that without elections, our legitimacy is ever dwindling. Pasternak sat his chair and addressed his attention to the outsiders, men of all salons, not just not shy about partaking, uh, partaking their thoughts on the provisional government. Good, I've invited these gentlemen from the so-called Decemberist, Bastillard, Humanist, and Modernist societies. Many good laws have been discussed in the city salons over the past few months. I've followed the renewal of the capital's, capital's cultural and political scene with much interest. And I believe it's now time to end the provisional government. A member threatened to boil into a debate. Pasternak rose a hand to silence it. This will be done with good order, and a suitable new constitution will be implemented. <clears throat> good gentlemen, these secessionists and rebels have shown more daring than us and have seized the moment. But I believe it is time to do some mobilizing of our own and tap into the great mind of the Republic. To see it endure into the next generations. I would like to hear the assembled men in this room detail what remains to be done before new elections can be called. Let's begin with you, General Shapushnikov. From many voices, a consensus will soon emerge. A part of the associations. Oh. Huh. Has not completed the focus of the death of the author. Oh. Mm -hmm. Alright, well, I want to get that more political power quickly. But getting stability is really nice, too. Let's do suspend the provisional government. Now it is the time. The stage is set for a new era of Russian democracy, or rather... Perhaps the stage is set for the final death of the Central Siberian Republic. President Pasternak is set to announce to the citizens, to the citizens of Tomsk, the dissolution of the provisional government. After shepherding us through years of crisis and stabilizing the situation, it is a little sad to see the last remnants of the CSR go. But as democracy is a progress that sees endless death and rebirth of a political power, so must the provisional government go for something else to take its place. Also, we are a little bit in debt. We're working on it too, but you know, it is what it is. Ah, uh, Speer, successor, huh? Let's see what happens with Speer there. We can do stuff here. I don't, I don't feel like doing it here. If that work conditions? Eh. I don't know about that. I, I like doing some of this stuff, too. We're going to need a more power grid, though. Which is not good. Yeah, we're going to need a lot of political power. Mm, I just want to raid the free aviators. They have loot, and I want their booties. And also, we have a little bit of deficit. Even though we did cut down a little bit on the debt already. We have a mediocre credit rating, which is god-awful. This is like all the grades I got when I was in elementary school. But whatever. We don't need to talk about my elementary school record. I'm too old for that now. Yeah, 1% well, growth, not good, but drafted in the political arena. Reams of paper were filling up every possible surface of the presidential office. Once in a while, bemused secretaries came in to stabilize the tottering piles of paper. Law and history books were strewn about, opened at seemingly random pages. In the middle of it all was the president, busy at work, of course. It was no easy feat to draft the Constitution, even with the dozens of legal advisors who had been given their own section to work on. Harder still was what Pasternak had in mind, a living, breathing thing, in which all would see the republic they envisaged. Pasternak's constitution would end the provisional government and begin a new era in the Republic, an era of experimentation, an era of wild and crazy ideas. Pasternak's task was to avoid placing himself in the center stage. His duty was to build a theater where all sorts of players might enter and lead the Republic's political th sphere, bringing in their own ideas and vision of the future. People would add on to the constitution and remove some things, yet it would live a spirit, a spark of the Pasternak's own dreams and failed ambitions. On and on the work went. Occasionally, a lawyer came in to discuss. In the afternoon, a nurse administered the president uh, his medicine for the day. Work progressed at a good pace. Every few days, a compilation of recent ideas and changes was sent to advisors both within and without the provisional government. The president worked feverishly, a maddened maestro directing a raucous orchestra into simple and enjoyable harmonics, all the world stage, and, and the Hall of Mirrors. Nikolai entered his favorite bar after a long shift. Working in the foundry was hard work, grueling work. The pay, however, was quite good, all better pr to provide for his family. The bar's usual layout was much changed that evening. T uh, tables and chairs had been arranged in a wide circle around a makeshift podium of bar stools. On it stood a gaunt figure of a man. The skeletal individual, dressed as an English dandy, recited line after line of lewd poetry, a beer mug in one hand and a calabash pipe in the other. 
The bar's habitual, habituals roared with laughter and hollered at the strange figure when the poet ended his recitation. Cheers and whistles crowded him out in the bar. A few of the men turned towards the door and noticed the confused Nikolai. Oh, oi, Golia, look what we got here. An actual presidential candidate. The emaciated poet turned to face a newcomer, bowed towards him, the makeshift bar stool uh, podium shaking. Daniel Karams, author, poet, not so humble representative of the Trinity Group of Culture and Industry known to all as a Bastelard Club at your service. Nikolai, of course, knew, the, knew of the author, most well known for his children's book, as well as the charity work to teach literacy, an eccentric man nowadays, a front for the elitist anti work of Bastelard society. Why bring politics here, poet? I thought you and the Bastelards had little wish to listen to the people. Harms nodded. Climbing down from his podium to talk, walk towards Nikolai, of course, of course. I'm an honest man. Why would I run on a campaign of lies? As the president, I want a strong republic, able to smash those efforts in Novosibirsk, and provide work and prosperity for all of us. Of course, every party claims that, but every party but ours claims that they care about the workers, don't they? Only the bastards are honest in their indifference. A chorus of laughter. A beer made its way to Nikolai, who cheered with a strange politician. Perhaps the elections this year will prove, provide entertainment, at least. A man of the people? But how about the First Amendment? Pasternak's new basic constitution has been so distributed wide throughout our nation so that every citizen can read it. Now it's time to legislate on its adoption. A committee consisting of members of the old provisional government as well as envoys from the four great salons has been assembled to review the constitution point by point. This tedious work must be done so that the new nation has a firm basis to stand on and so that each salon's candidate has a good idea of what they're going to campaign on. Great writing is achieved through thorough editing. It's time for the poet's president's last great work to be made ready for publication. As we're going to raid the free aviators, because everybody set up for us to do so. Yes, please. Equipment, yes. The Petrov Salon, a fundamental tutelage. If Anatoly had thought his family represented a microcosm of the Republic, of opposing viewpoints engaged in a spirit debate, he soon found that the army was even more so. However, and unlike his family, a Bastelard drill instructor could refuse to accept that. Uh, <clears throat> A soft humanist could not run 10 kilometers only after a week of exercise. A modernist intelligence officer could scoff at the slow Decembrists who took an extra hour to classify all the anarchist vehicles. Every group, it seemed, had some way to strike against the other. Anatoly had found that factionalism inherent to the Republic alive and well in the military, though no one would ever, no action would ever escalate to outright malice or insubordination. The undercurrent was always there. He wondered if such discord was also present in the Duma, and if President Pasternak had ever been frustrated by others in similar fashion. The thought st saddened him, but he supposed, much like his, with his own family, disputes within him did not necessarily mean a lack of overall unity. Indeed, despite those differences in outlook and behavior between him, his soldiers, and their superiors, they could all agree that the Republic was an ent entity worth defending. That, under the careful and intelligent command of Marshal Shapushnikov, they would act to ethically expand the reach of multi-party democracy to a region long denied it and to those suffering so long under oppression. He was proud that he had made his choice to join it and could not but feel eager to, one day be on the march, a republic worth fighting for, and then at the end of an era. President Pasternak stood in front of the Cathedral of Epiphany, alone on his podium. The cathedral had seen better days, as they had their president. The assembled crowd thought, even so, both stood, proudly domineering Lenin Square. More and more men and women crowded into the plaza, lured by the end of the workday to see the president in what us all assumed to be one of its final public oratories. Ah, citizens, friends, I come to you personally to announce the end of the provisional government and the aftermath of the great calamities that fell in the Republic. You came forward and granted us our request for an emergency tribute. No, the free tribute. For emergency provisional government. With this vote of confidence in hand, the government and I blindly stumbled forward, like drunks holding onto a train ticket, afeared of losing it and being unable to reach your destination. I now realize that our greatest mistake is that what you try to shoulder on the burden of riding the ship of state all on our own. For this great arrogance, this government has found itself unable to leave the dark valley in which it has erred in the past few years, unable to lead its people to a better place. The provisional government must end, and in its place, the people must take up their roles, act on the power granted to them by our republic. A thousand million assembled candles will unite to illuminate our paths. Citizens, I simply ask for your forgiveness, and thank you for your years of support. I fear no evil, as we will go ahead and do this and uh, pay off the debt. A little bit more. Across the lines, Dimitri. It's been some time since we talked, and I thought it would be worthwhile to catch up. It gave me much joy to discover you were so alive and well, even with all the chaos happening beyond the Urals. I'm... Not certain what is happening over there, but my admittedly scattered sources do not paint an optimistic picture. I sincerely hope you are keeping safe. Whatever the case, I thought I'd enlighten you as what I've been up to for the past few years, no doubt. You've already heard about the Operation Silverov and the massive gosh darn disaster that was. It was not from lack of trying. We had those fascist pigs on the ropes, and if I had my way, I'd be writing this letter from Moscow rather than some peasant village. These effing careerists would rather look to their own interests than fight for a cause greater than themselves. I urge Marshal Voroshilov every week that I, he needs to take a harder stance against our enemies, but he continues to give me the same tired excuse. We're not ready. We must look to our people first. It's driving me insane. Sometimes I feel like he'd rather take advice from Zukov than I. He's a good man, sure, but... Does he really have the stomach for what must be done in the name of reunification? Perhaps I vented about my problems for far too much. I apologize, my friend, but 
I've been rather frustrated as of late. Please don't be afraid to tell me of your own exploits, as I'm sure our troubles have much in common. Regards, Mikhail Nikolaevich Tukhachevsky. Stressful, stressful days. Great progress. I dreamed of a scientist, Andrei Sakharov, sat in his small study. Dimly led by the old light bulb that had kept him company for so long, thoughts came into his mind one minute and went out the next, a never-ending cycle. He looked back down towards his papers, calculations on some ideas and on others, but today it wasn't the physics problem that he cared about. He wanted to work on Russia's problems. The failures of the democracy and the failures of the military, all of Russia's modern history seemed to be a failure, kind of like mine. He thought back to the past where the central Siberian Republic fell into disarray. Sakharov had not been a major politician, but now, as he went to meeting, after meeting and the modernist salons, it seemed his prominence had grown and Andre continued to think. But he was ignoring his physics papers now. They didn't matter as much. Tomsk, Siberia, Russia, everything had been destroyed by dictators in past and present. They needed to move into a new future, one of democracy and modernity. Now Andre dreamed. He dreamt of a modernist future and a modernist Russia. One that cared about the people and improved their everyday lives. One where he was the president. What Russia could be like with a strong democracy and a powerful government. What Tomsk could be like if it could stand up to despots and radicals of the South. And what Siberia could be with like a functioning economy and a higher quality of life. As his pen continued to write word after word on the papers, his old light bulb dimmed more and more, barely lighting his desk at all. Andre smiled and he left his office to finally replace it. A dark world grows ever brighter. Can we do this? We need more uh, support in here. So 99 divided by 2 is almost 50, so we need like 2 more for lower house majority. Mm, I want to do that one, but Central Severe and Expansion is nice, but we can't do one yet, obviously. So lower house majority. What's this one? Tumps? Oh, crap. I forgot. Oh, I remember this now. I remember how we had to do this up. Oh my goodness. One. Oh, Jesus Christ. Lower house. Uh, where are we at here? Because I'll read this in just a little bit. So we're Bastelars, right? Lower house, upper house is not bad. Upper house. <laughs> wow. Lower house approval is pretty darn not good. We have a lot of Decembers, don't we have up here? We can Bastelar authority. Popularity in a random district. Anti Bastelar propaganda. As for Bastelar to part in the lower house. We lose 25 political power, decreases December's salon authority, increases our authority, greatly increases lower house support. Ask for support in the upper house. Well, we need lower house, so. Try it once. Hey, 49, not bad. Let's see if we can do this. We need, four, oh, we need one more. God dang it, are you kidding me? Tchaikovsky. You gotta watch it, I swear. I had my doubts too, but it blew past me, it blew me away. Said Igor, who was again pestering his old good friend Dimitri about watching one of his latest hit films, a biographical film on the life and times of composer Pyotr Ilyich Tchaikovsky. Again, it sounds fascinating, but I've never been much of a moviegoer. The lines are long, you have to sit around for two hours, and they're never as good as advertised, replied Dimitri, and what he was sure to be exact repeat of the conversation they had last time they ate lunch together. If you want to this, please go right ahead. Oh, good. Inokenti Smoktunovsky made it makes it all worthwhile. It's not like he's those wooden actors you see in other movies. Igor said as he dug his knife into a stake. The fact was news to Dimitri, but it was so so was the name. Who the heck is that? One of the king of Siberian actors. He really brings Tchaikovsky to life. Well, you know, I was worried about it not being worth it because of the acting. What the heck? For you, old friend, I'll wait through that darn endless line, but I'll get to complain about it if it's bad for as long as you try to convince me to watch it. Deal? Deal. Anyway, how's your brother? How's your brother? Uh... Uh, that's not bad. Power Associations. We well, did that once. Oh, actually, we get more. Oh, that's Upper House, though. Uh, Empire of the Associations. In the years since the grand evacuation of Russia's class of intellectuals to Central Siberia, they have ex had to adapt to the new environment. Over time, as expected, they organized themselves into small groups and associations. Sometimes they would be built on their common profession, giving way to teams of poets, musicians, scientists, and philosophists. Others were created on the basis of a common ideology or belief, many of which had a chance to be heard in the Central Siberian Republic. Tom Tomsk houses a vibrant and colorful collection of these associations, who hold significant sway on how things are run in the last remnant of the Central Siberian Republic. If the president is to finally dissolve the government and begin the process of transition, these groups will be critical, giving the support to the system and thus being the founding blocks of democracy. Thus, they must not be abandoned by the administration, but instead empowered and encouraged. God dang, we need more lower house support. support. God dang it. <laughs> ah, why? Why do you pay me so? Um, we can do stuff here, but I want to get that one done stuff stuff up first. I want to get that one done. Integrate the salons. In the era of the revolutionary friends, the salons were cultural hubs that encouraged social interaction and were composed of intellectuals who were exchanging spread their own idea. Much like then, the salons have been revived in our own small republic now by a new generation of artists and scientists who still have the same goals and dreams, thankfully. They all have one in common, their loyalty to an indivisible democratic Russia, something that Pasternak's government believes in as well. 
it would not be difficult to begin the process of contacting the Salans, aligning them to the Republic's goals, and then finally integrating them into the social and political life of the nation in which they reside. The theoretician and the engineer. Oh, thank you for your papers, Sakharov said, taking the bundle of Tomsk morning papers from Kamal's hands. How much for these? They sat in the parlor of the modernist section of the building, shelves upon shelves of scientific books, and journals lined up upon the alcoves of the room. Outside they could hear the city, sleepy city of Tomsk arousing herself awake as a car thrummed and blared and paper boys announcing the most recent items in the papers aloud. Eh, Kemal said, taking it back by Sakharov's manners. You really don't too. It's pennies on the dollar anyways, Professor. Come on, Sakharov, Pyreed. Wearing a kind of serene smile. I'd feel bad if I had to have my papers at your expense. No, Professor, Kemal laughed. It's not even tr rubles. Drop it. Kemal laid a hand on Sakharov's shoulder. Just think of it as a favor for the coffee the other day. Sakharov smirked. Thanks. He glanced at the top front page. Uh, of the newspaper and began reading the headline a president pastor not terminally ill new towns for the republic you know newspapers have this uncanny ability to deliver even grave news with bombast maybe it's a capital letters would newspapers even exist 10 years from now if the republic elects you i think not you flatter me come up i serve a term or two and then get out gotta keep the system running have you thought of a successor Ah, oh, I think you'll do. The remark shocked Kemal. I am but a theoretician. You are an engineer. I lay the foundations. You make it work. But I... I'm going to get some coffee. You want some? Milk and two cubes, please. You musician, musician and the marshal. Mikhail, it's good to hear from you. I admit it. Not been paying much attention to whatever's happening beyond the girls. And I'm glad you were able to shed some light on that. I am, as you probably guessed, so alive and well, regrettably. I've not had much opportunity to accomplish much in the way of musical pursuits as of late, as my obligations to the CSR have stolen my undivided attention. I realize I've mentioned in the past that I have no love for politics, but strange circumstances such as these demand strange answers. If I can make a positive impact in this broken country, I will spare no effort. What you have told me concerns me deeply, however. I sense a great deal of pent-up rage within your words, and that your frustrations seem to be getting the better of you. As your friend, I would sincerely advise caution. Venting is healthy, so I will not discourage you on the front, however. Please ensure that you do not lose yourself to your frustrations. A man in your position would do well to keep a cool head, for it would be easy to commit evil deeds on the fields of battle and about wild and about of wild rage. Take care, Dmitri Dmitrievich Shostakovich, a troubled soul. And now for some cold coffee. Oh boy. The last of old St. Petersburgers. The young man knocked at the door. A faint reply to enter quickly. The secretary found his boss, Dmitri Likai, uh, Likachov. Standing at the window with a cup of coffee. On his desk, a pile of papers was neatly stacked next to a typewriter. The December Society's new manifesto, most likely, the young man stood at the door and waited at his boss's orders. Lekhakchev. Lekhakchev. Looked to the horizon, no doubt observing the Tom River as it snaked to the next capital. The famed historian and medievalist had asked for a window view on the river. The reason was known to all, mentioned by none. The older man missed St. Petersburg, the city of his youth. No doubt he found the Tom River a poor substitute for the Neva, meaning the Baltic Sea. As the Tom River was to the Neva, so was Tomsk the quaint Siberian city, the St. Petersburg, crisscross bridges and canals. A treasure of the Russian people lost to the advancing tide of fascism. The young man thought to himself that it was the blessing he was too young to know, the sorrow of the older generation, the sadness of the last St. Petersburger. Likhachov Finally turned to the secretary. Thank you for leading me to my thoughts for a few moments more. The manifesto is completed. Have the others review it and distribute it. Yes, sir, the young man picked up the papers. So you're throwing your name on the app? Likhachov nodded. I have faith in the Russian people, he paused. His eyes distant for a moment. We've we've lost much of these past few years, but we can rebuild. We must rebuild. If only despite those who seek only destruction, I think Harms and Sakharov and the other candidates, they get this. But they're too hasty to throw away the old days. We must bring back the past with us. Now go. We have much to do. The secretary nodded. Dmitry Likhachov smiled, nodded back, head to his desk. His cup of coffee had forgotten on the window, so no matter. The Tomsk River would still be flowing when his work would be done for the day. Look at the December of old. We'll fight to the west. The legacy of a democratic Russia. The Russian Republic, murdered in its infancy by Bolshevism, shackled Russian freedom to a fragile and unsteady regime. The Central Siberian Republic, a fragile creature lying in the ashes of the Soviet Union, torn apart by traitors and rebellions. Our Republic has heir to two of the 20th century's most disappointing governments, inherited the dream twice shattered by external events. This dream should not be betrayed a third time. We dream of a Russia free, its people's future taken back from fascists and despots. Citizens to arms, fight for what is yours. Actually, since we're here, authority, 32%, huh? Upper house seats, 49, god dang it. Oh, how long did we wait? Uh, oh, we can do that again. In the meantime, 15. Can we raid? No. Can we get scavenged or anything? No. Um, I probably want to do one of these, though. Industrial capacity is 1.5%. Production efficiency gain. That's in heavy construction technique. Eh, it's, it's not bad. What, what, what are you doing? Factory output. Oh, that's not good. Production quotas. GDP growth will increase. Oh. That's not much. That's honestly not much at all, but more I see and growth. Okay, we'll definitely take that one for now. 
pursuing a feverish dream. Our adversaries mock us as a soft, lacking in backbone, too fragile for the Russian anarchy. They decry our obsession with democracy, with freedom, and their fair with fairness, as wholly unsuited for the tough realities of modern Russia. Let him laugh, for the dream we chase so feverishly is a vision of a new Russia, unbroken, undaunted, free from the past. past. The Tsar's autocratic regime did not succeed in crushing this free spirit of our people, nor did the NKVD thugs terrorize their way to subservience. To say nothing of the German fascists, having hoped against reason to see their nihilism affect the character of our people, render us subservient and incapable of dreaming of the future. The Republic does not endure in the spirit of its dreams, but precisely because of them. We will show the world the strength of our resolve. Nice. Nothing else here. Uh, you know what? We need... I want to do a power grid. Yeah. Emptying the offices. It been an ungrateful task for sure. Some of the young bureaucrat knew he'd miss a job anyway. He lifted another sack of off supplies into the box. Few remained at this time of day. Most had already moved out of the... In the days preceding the announcement, now only the young bureaucrat and a few stragglers worked on keep moving out of the building. Here and there, a few radios kept them company, all of them humming a record of Pasternak's speech dissolving the provisional government. Their office had been one of the subcommittees of the provisional government's ministry of the industry. Diligently, the men and women had counted what remained of the CSR's industrial assets, what had been lost to the rebels, and what needed to be done to stabilize their situation. In the end, all their efforts had not amounted to much. The provisional government didn't have a lot of resources to be devoted to massive industrial redevelopment efforts. Better to maintain the slow decay than risk it all, however. Not with all lost. The reports have been compiled into easy to digest analyses, and the spread to the public by the government itself. The bureaucrat had heard that among the circles of rapidly expanding political clubs, his team's work had been widely discussed and argued about. The bureaucrat smiled, closed his box. Perhaps the new administration would have the new work cut for him and his team, flinging a light into the future. Can we raid? We're ready to raid. We're ready to raid. Mm, yeah, we still have that successful raid thing. Darn it. The death of the author. Boris uh, passed, uh, Nack has passed away. He leaves behind loving friends and family, a colossal literary output, and an important political legacy. Critics both within and without the Republic have accused him and his government of causing many of the catastrophes that has befallen the Central Serbian Republic now, however. None deny was his deny none will deny his fervent belief in a renewed Russia. Free and democratic, nor is ever to prepare the Republic for life after him. All future leaders of the nation will live in the shadow of this flawed but courageous founding father. A week of mourning has been declared, and arrangements are being made for the state funerals for the former president, the passing. There will be no more productive days for the poet president. Boris Pasternak had laid in bed for almost two weeks now, coughing fitifully. The student attended to him. Old friends, old rivals came to visit him. His wife, Zinadia, Zinaida, had come to talk, and the talk they had. She had forgiven him some, though, although not all. Better th uh, than nothing, his love, Olga Ivinskaya. Had also come by. How he wished he could have seen her more, have some, have had something better for her than a few short visits, ushered in through the side door. Another regret for a life of regret. He had not done right to his wife nor his mistress. Hopefully he had done right to his country. Harder and harder to stay awake, pit, fitful sleep, late afternoon coating the room in amber light, standing by the bed, one of his sons saying something, hard to see him well, hear him well. I can't hear you, and there's there's mi a mist in front of my eyes. He tried to smile, but it will go away, won't it? Don't forget to open the windows tomorrow. A joint passes. Oh boy. The permanence of the manuscript. Two sets of writings render Boss Pasternak immortal. First is his literacy, literary work, his poems, his translations, his magnum opus, Dr. Zivago. Oh, yeah, yeah. The second set of writings are his political efforts to lead the Republic a new constitution, and a clear way to arrange the transition of power. A new duel must be assembled and rule the Republic until a new president is chosen. We will ensure President Pasternak's legacy by following his final will. It has given us the tools we need to end the crisis caused by the collapse of the C.S.R. And which we'll see what happens. How's the death doing? Points are not great. It's going up, dip, and up. Media blitz. We need more money. The posters had cropped up from the one day to the next with a little with a little warning. Workers and scholars held together in the train station during the proclamation. Citizens, elections have begun now. Candidacy for the state Duma are now accepted from the four great political stations or salons of this republic. Per the late president's final constitution, approved by the Electoral Commission, the socio-political rejuvenation of the republic will pass through the popular movements known as the Decembrists, Bastelards, Humanists, and Modernists. This collage of political uh, associations will tutor the reborn republic through these turbulent times. A party with presidential control of the republic will offer a new constitution, allowing the people to experiment with their political institutions. Citizens, the republic needs you. It has asked you for so much already. Now in this zero hour, the nation needs your opinion your insight. At the ballot box, inform us about your vision for this new era. We shall be tasked with voting for our local representative, as well as a vote for presidential candidate. Citizens, your help is critical. 
the news of elections rang through the nation like an electrifying current. Much remained unknown for now in particular. Few knew the, well the four political parties that had been chosen for election. F fewer still understood the implications of voting for a constitution. But the presidential candidates were amongst the well-known men of Tomsk. The idea of moving past the era of controlled destitution with the provisional government was an appalling, appealing one. Election season has begun. Nice. Petro Salon, oblivion of impetus. The news of President Boris Pasternak's death had Anatoly Petrov like a sledgehammer. The impact such that he was forced to physically sit. He had not thought of himself capable of feeling such despair for anyone other than a member of his own family, but upon reflection, he understood. Pasternak's inspirational speeches were the reason he had decided to enlist, and he had defined the worldly ideals that a man of conscience, such as Anatoly, could not ignore. Now he was gone, and Anatoly was adrift. Almost as distressing was the response of many of the soldiers and officers around him. Though they were all, of course, expressed public mourning for the president, in private, and within their own salon cliques, they all spoke of excitement about the chance for their own faction to emerge victorious from the elections that everyone knew would be announced in short order, even those that, like himself, called themselves humanists. And until they stayed far away, how could a true humanist express remorse for a great man's death while simultaneously looking with relish at the chance to replace him? And what did it mean that so many would do with so seemingly no remorse or self-awareness of this fact? He could find no answers to such disturbing questions. He did know, however, that things were about to change for himself, having now completed training for his family, where the arguments over the table would only grow more heated as any election progressed, and which he knew he would soon hear about in the letters, and finally for the Republic as a whole, where the outcome of the election could determine its entire course for years to come, though he could not suppress his unease and until he believed he had to believe in the institutions of the Republic itself, that they would endure, that he did not want to think about the alternative, a visionary taken too soon. The last solstice day. Elections are afoot! The Republic stands at a crossroads, with several factions running for the state Duma, as well as struggling to gain the presidency. Past next faith in educated and talented members of the Tomsk intel intelligentsia should not go unrewarded, as the nation's very best hammer out one another's ideas so that the truth and progress spring forth out of the ballot box. Set for the darkest days of the year, the elections will seek to fill the Duma before a president is elected and a constitution is chosen for the nation's next four year. Four years and the open window. Among the various ideologues and thinkers who desire to shape the future of the Republic, the four great salons of the Bastillard, Decembrist, Humanist, and Modernist societies desire to take hold of the Duma and Presidency. As each faction makes its case, it remains unclear which issue will be dominant one for the electoral campaign. The citizens of the Republic are divided, of course, and it remains to be seen in the Decembrist platform of respect for tradition and rural democracy will triumph over the Bastillard and Modernist ideals of urban and industrial renewal. Or perhaps the Humanist society, social democracy, or social de democratic platform, a decentralized democracy, an investment into people or clinch, or clinch the debate. Always we want to raid. And can we get a little bit more support down here with this? It costs a lot of political power to do this. 51, though. We can hopefully at least do this, right? Oh, now we know more political oh. power. So now we can propose the military program. And hopefully this goes well for us. And do we lose any support? No, we still have lower house majority. Still have upper house majority as well, which is good. Um, Meng Jiang defeated the Mongolian People's Republic. As we can now do some military expansion. Ooh, do more drills. Oh, that's not bad. You lose some political power, but you get quite a bit more army XP. Scavenge weapons is not bad either. Prepare for war. A uh, weapon research project. Okay, it's not bad. And build up arms factory. Ooh. Increase our liquid reserves by 65% of our monthly income. Well, okay, so it sucked. We lose $0.005 billion, but you get $0.009 billion. Uh huh. That's interesting. So basically. You lose political power, but you get more money. Do you actually get a military factory, though? Huh. I'm not really sure if you do, but... Let's do that. We're doing Strategic Theorem, of course, like normal. Attrition Planning, because I think that's the best one for us right now. And please let us raid somebody. Please let us raid somebody here. And we're still trying to build the electrical plan here, too. So, that's good as well. The open window. Whispers of a camaraderie. Decembrist. The stammering of machinery and the humming of the music, which uh, if you want to read about this one, please go ahead. I played, I did, like I said before, I did go this route before, so we're not going to go that way. Um, let me take a quick look. Bastelods, modernists, humanists, decembrists. I kind of want to go with decembrists. They do have 26 seats. 13 seats is not great, but it's not that bad either. Decembrists, huh? A conservative democracy. Now, I know some people want me to go down. Actually, there's people who want me to go every direction. And I apologize, I cannot do every direction, but I will play Tom's like at least two more times to go every single path. <sighs> I do want to do modernist. Sakharov sounds like so much fun. Party ideology is just straight up socialism, huh? Harms. <sighs> I kind of want to go to Decembrists. We'll see what Decembrists. So my apologies, we're not going the way you want. So 
whispers of camaraderie. It is a truth not acknowledged enough in Russian history that true power lies in the people, and that the songs and traditions of the past need not be mocked and dismissed as hindrances to our future. Lived by the medievalist Dmitry Lekachev, the December society is run on a classical liberal platform of respect for the citizenry, of reforms of the criminal system, and of respect for industrial development, and that preserve Russia's environment for the future. Critics of the Decembers decry them as soft hearted paternalists, elitists yet unwilling to go all the way into derigisme. Let them complain that December society knows that the Russians throughout the ages have embraced new ideas and new ways of doing things, and that the state need not browbeat the people into submission. Just took it away. Oh, no, actually, maybe not. Some people don't have loot. Ooh, Black Army. Ah, uh, I don't know about beating up the Black Army. Yeah. Or even uh, either Black Army or the Black Disc League. Ooh. Who's got that looty booty? I mean, the Siberian Black Army does. I don't want to raid them, though. The Black Army is not going to be easy to beat. <sighs> that sucks. Now, if people want to try to raid us, I'm kind of okay with that. Ooh, I forgot about this, too. Thank you. More research speed. Thank you very much. History of the Siberian Expansion. Maxim couldn't believe he was still here. If he explained it to himself yesterday, he still wouldn't believe it. Maxim was just a humble public servant. His parents were farmers who would send him off to the city to make a life for himself. Heck, he could barely even read, much less form any opinion on such esoteric subjects like Siberian history, but here he was, and a symposium, a word he couldn't even define until yesterday when he was informed of his invitation on the history of Russia's expansion into Siberia. The poster struck out to him, or stuck out to him when he saw it, an academic discussion, historical lesson, and banquet wrapped it up into one not just for the scholars but for the common people of central siberia quite frankly he just come for the free food and drinks but he couldn't help but find an interest in a subject he barely understood so uh, philosophers politicians artists and academics fought on the proverbial battlefields of historical debate information was shared that maxim could only dream of deals brokered with local tribes great kindness spreading across what is now his own home people's long gone and their customs it was all both confusing and enlightening to the point maxim had left his plate only half finished as he sat for at least an hour drinking deeply from the cup of knowledge when it was all over, he almost felt dizzy from the experience, but found himself still remembering everything he had been told. As he and the rest of the com common folk filtered out of the hall, they talked about what they had learned, new perspectives they had formed, and of course how they never knew they could get caught up in something they had once viewed so as dull. As Maxime walked home that night, his thoughts wandered to ancient history on their own, and resolved to begin paying visits to libraries and lectures in the future. Knowledge, of course, is power, not to you men. I didn't go over our own uh, national spirits here either. They get attack and defense bonus. Ooh, unorthodox Bolshevism. Euro motive plant, factory output, motorized attack, mausoleum, of course, construction speed, and that's all they have. Uh, division wise, they have five divisions, including a tank division, which is pretty not bad for them. We do have two motorized here, which have no tanks in them ourselves, which does suck. Um, Euro League. Uh, we could do those guys, maybe. Hmm. What's over here? Ah, uh, the GUI, yeah. And we did say we won't go to December. Ooh. Oh, we can do this one. Or Novosibirsk as well. And Novosibirsk. That's 37. They're just like us. They are literally just like us. Would we be able to beat them? We could try it. And if it doesn't go well, we can always do some funky stuff off screen. And we have this one as well. December. A. Ask for a support. Pro December campaign. In a random district, consolidate rule. Greatly increases salon authority. Oh, I forget what authority it does. They don't have a lot of authority, though. Which is, They have a lot of approval, though. Um, 15%, 35%. Click for interactions, click for interactions. We could always lower their authority, too. We could raise authority. Popularity is pretty good, though. Greatly increases their authority. Or we go over here and just lower their authority. But I'd rather raise up these guys and push these guys down, probably. So, pro campaign. Actually, where are we at for the campaigns? December's pretty good. December's okay there. Pretty good. Oh, okay ish. Eh, we're gonna uh, Campaign. There you go. 20.5%. That's a little better. The open window. Oh. Very nice. Oh god, no. Look at all this stuff. Uh, we'll go with agricultural methods next, maybe? Why not? Oh, your old military district. Oh boy. Western Siberia. Oh, and Nova Siberia is gone. Oh, we have to wait for the, them to be right there. Um, oh, that's Krasnoyarsk. Oh, Krasnoyarsk is not going to be easy. 
if I remember correctly. Oh, actually, no. Crest Norask is not bad. Yeah, let's get over to Crest Norask then. There we go. And we're gonna wait for that. Prepare for war. Got a little more political power now. Um, Workers' discontent is low. Like I said, I'm not sure how far we can push that. Since you're severe in expansion, no, we're good for now. Um, nothing here really. Prepare for war. We lose weekly stability. Holy crap, 1%. That's not good. We have rifles. How many guns are we out? We're actually doing really well on guns. We actually have a little bit of artillery too. We need some anti tank. Or oh, I forgot to set this up off screen too. Um, we need some motorized. This game is a lag, lag super hard right now. So we have anti tank. We have these. We need APCs. We need support equipment, which we do have motorized and APCs. Um, helicopters. We're not going to use those. We're not going to use experimental helicopters. Anti air. Uh, we might want to use that actually. Now let's grab some main battle tanks. Fighters, casts, and all these other planes. We could use transports for supplies, but I think we'll be okay without them for this campaign. That'll be fine. We have arms factories. We get more debt, but then we get more money. That's not really worth it for us right now. Guns, that's okay. Research speed is not bad. More war support is not bad, but I'm not going to lose stability. So any of this stuff, not really worth it. Maybe except for this one. This one was not bad. Getting more army XP could be really, really beneficial for what I want us to do. We'll do it once. We'll do it once. Why not? Screw it. We'll do it once. And we'll do some more stuff here too next. But let's go back up. So we can get ready to do Crest Norsk. Oh wait, free aviators. Ah, screw it, do it, free aviators. They're just better to do because it, that's it's basically guaranteed. It's quite literally basically guaranteed to win. A walk in the forest. Critical to the December society's view of Russian development and Russia is Russia herself. A land of forests and plains settled by hardworking men and women. An archipelago of communities out in the endless green sea of the Siberian forests. Such a land produces hardy folks, yet yeah. it also creates endless cultural exchange between the West, between the East, Russia is a melting pot, a place where ideas are traded, and where the people slowly incorporate new ways of doing things into their own life. To take a walk in the forest of Tomsk is to see why the Decembrists must leave the Republic. Only the December society and Dmitry Lakachikov understands how Russia came to be and how it shall continue to evolve, of course. Initiate a raid, good. And we'll do some more stuff down there. Focus on research is not bad, industrial developments. We get another production unit, which is really nice. That's actually really, really nice. External investments and get more money. 0.24 billion would be superb. 0.24 could help pay off quite a bit here. Oh, another division, though. Another two divisions, though. Nice. If you distribute, good. And a successful raid, of course. Oh, we got 0 0.029 billion. We'll gladly take it. Not bad. One whole loot. And oh, who is this? Happy June, everybody. Happy, happy June. Come down here, and then we'll do production facilities. Treasure, if you want to buy that, please go ahead. More political power and even more money. Beautiful, my friends. Heavy construction techniques. Um, We could do that. More IC. What's that one? Do both these. It's fine. It's fine. Implement working concessions. I don't know. We could probably really push it really hard. Legacy of Siberian plan. Not bad. No money left, but whatever. 55.4%. Deficit's still looking pretty bad. Max out civvy spending, even though we don't have that much anyways, but whatever. Not bad. The associations make their vote. The time has come for the associations present in the Duma to vote. With the hearing of speeches made by each candidate and debates in the Duma and salons, it seems all have come to a clear choice. The new president to be voted in will wield the executive power of the government and will decide how all of Tomsk will move forward into the future. Also, with the election of the president comes the party's own constitution, which allows a party to govern how they want, instead of governing within the rules of the said constitution. While it may only last as long as the party is in power, it means that each party has the power to transform the entire government. The association's vote could quite frankly and possibly change the future of Tomsk. A most unusual political event. A strange idea to hold a political rally out in the woods. There was a gentle summer breeze as men and women were heading out in the air. Uh, it opened an open air festival organized by the December Society on the shores of the Tom River from a nearby train station. Local peasants, organized by the branch of December Salon and monks from a nearby monastery, had already organized a large temporary cabin in which tables, benches, and fires could be used. A day of drinking, poetry, and praying in political speeches. Presidential hopeful Dmitry Lekhachev. Welcome, the, those that arrived. Thank you for taking the time to come here. He told the assembled crowd of city folk, engineers, scientists, and ordinary workers. It is certainly a commitment to travel out here on a bright summer day. By sometimes leaving one's habitual home, it lets us leave one his habitual thought patterns, yes? The day's events were remarkably con convivial. Convivial. 
peasants intermingle with industrial workers and university academics. Songs and traditional poems and plays were enjoyed by all. Each discussed their problems. Few easy solutions came from the conversations, especially once a participant had had their share of alcohol and good food, but the ties that bind the invisible strings that link one Russian to another were considerably reinforced. As the city folk trudged back to the station, often supported by their new peasant friends, the prospects of mending the old Central Siberian Republic didn't seem so poor after all. All of us Russians with one beating heart. A whole other production would be so nice to have, though. The gymnasiums follow suit. With the associations now having voted, it is time for the regular people of Tomsk to do the same. While not choosing out every candidate as a Duma did, the people choose the two who had the most support of the Duma. Once the people's votes are counted, the new president and Salon will take power. It's expected, however, that the first choice of the Duma will be the first choice of the people as well, as the Duma was just voted in by the people a few months earlier. Meanwhile, to further complicate things, the educator also put into special pools to be able to vote onto more specific matters. This will be dictated by the Constitution and the ruling party puts into place, but can vary from choosing ministerial positions to having no special powers at all. Nice. Nice job, guys. Nice job. Anything up here we really care about? No. Military category? No. It's all only June, so that's fine. Focal point production parts. Um, increases gain? That's fine. Work at concessions. Workplace safety. Resource extraction. Okay, we'll just max it out. Okay, that's fine. And only discontent with 26. New chairman. The results are in and a new president has finally been chosen. After weeks of campaigning and speeches, a new face can finally lead Tomsk into the future. A new agenda and constitution have been chosen and it's finally time for the people to be led into a new path. Tomsk can finally move on from a provisional government to a legitimate one. The future looks bright for a democracy and for Russia. A new republic has risen. One that can come forward as a representative and protector of all who yearn for freedom and, of course, democracy. Look at that debt. GDP. Holy crap. Not great. Where do you go? No one knows. But more stability is always a good thing. Always. Hey, nice. Good. Good. I might do external investments just to get some more, a little bit more money. 0.29, Oh, production quarters is pretty good though. Oh, that growth is not much. Well, we did get some more IC. Mm, we're only at 1.8%. Not great. Mm. Oh, we can scam for loot though. Loot, loot, loot. We like those looty little booties. The new chairman. We have the flight east. We have a provisional government. We have a city a warlord of the city. As well as formation of the salons, which is very good for us. As well as, uh, like I see the Siberian plan as well. War in the desert. Ah, what a war. Go and train. Victory for the Decemberists. It had been a melancholy crowd that gathered in front of the Cathedral of Epiphany to listen to Boris Pasternak's speech about the end of the provisional government, or republic. Now the mood of the public in the early morning was much different. Amidst jubilant Decemberists, ordinary citizens had gathered in the square, curious to see the new president. After, after the end of vote counting the previous Ned, Dmitry Lakachikov of the Decemberist Society had won the presidency of the republic. Lakachkov's speech was brief but concise. After thanking his voters for their tireless support, he expressed his sincere hope that the other salons would accept them as president and work with them. He went on to explain which reforms he would pursue, chief among them being reforming Tomsk's prison system, overhauling the rural infrastructure that tied the scattered cities and villages of the Republic together, and robust protections for the environment and Russia's traditions. In contrast with this very rational and calculated string of objectives, Lakachkov added a flourish of emotion to cap off his speech as a scholar. I spent long... Long my days reading about Russian history, and about the good people of wide steppes and deep forests, about their ability to incorporate new, incorporate new ideas and strange customs into their own life. I must thank you all once more for giving me this old student of Russian history, a chance to make up his own mark on the destiny of the great society. Russian freedoms endure within all of us. Our future is ours for the taking. Towards our fate, carrying the past with us. Nice. Well, hello there, Likachov. What do you focus? Victory for the December Society. The December Society has won the elections. It is time for Tomsk to cast its gaze inward on the peasants and the workers that have always been the fertile soil in which the Russian nation has grown. These workers must be led, protected, and cherished by the elites of the city, much as dutiful parents seek to let children grow strong and independent. These are difficult times for the Republican dream in Russia. Beyond our border, treacherous Siloviki, deranged kings and riding anarchists plot the demise of our nation. As the Republic is to endure, we must show the citizens that we are there for them, and that the story of the Russian rebirth is theirs, and theirs alone. Our December's forerunner fought to free the serfs from cruel bondage. Likewise, we shall unshackle the Russian nation from the anarchy that plagues it. The Three Sons of the Union. The December Society is indebted to its recent history. Most importantly, the Decembers inherit three issues, or rather three opportunities, from the Soviet Union's downfall and the chaos that has followed. In order, these are a vast quantity of highly educated citizens among deprived workers, a countryside that is both underdeveloped and yet seeing its natural beauty eroded away, and finally a prison system that is overcrowded and incapable of reforming citizens. 
The December society knows that the elite of our society must tend to the masses. Our government equally places great importance on the Russian landscape for its beauty as well as its opportunities. Following our poli political salon knows that the prison system is an important aspect of society. A set of kidneys that filter out toxic elements from our republic while letting go cleanse elements back into the world. We must get to work on these three issues. The library. The library stood in Tomsk for generations and made it largely unscathed through the violence of the Russian Civil War and the chaos of the Soviet Union's collapse. Even the near disillusion of the Republic had left the library untouched. Its walls housed the knowledge of all Russia. The caretakers of the library had done all they could, with the generous help of the salons, to keep its grand archives in shape. Indeed, the library was one of the few places in all of Russia that could maintain and pres preserve the manuscripts of Russia's past. Vadim Petsov had watched over the library since his youth before the fall of the old union. Soon, it would be time for him to retire and add and allow his successors to take over. However, before he could, he had one last contribution to make. He sat nervously in his office, practically vibrating in his seat as he awaited news from the man he had hired. It had been almost a month since he had sent the warp wanderer on a mission beyond the Urals. The man was so to infiltrate Perm and return to the grandest, greatest bounty in all of Russia, the original Ostomir Gospel Manuscript. The text that was held hostage in Perm, a sign of legitimacy for the Aryan regime. As the day turned to night, Vadim began to give up hope that the manuscript would be recovered. However, before despair could grip his heart, the door opened. The stranger strode into the room with a slight lump, he noticed, with a duffel bag carefully cradled in his arms. Without a word, the man set the bag down onto his desk and opened it. He took the medieval text from the bag and gently placed it in front of him. Vadim was frozen in shock and excitement. He had dealt with the stranger's abilities, and yet here he was, manuscript in hand. Vadim examined it closely, seeing it for himself, the damage was wrought by the Nazis' neglect. It would be a long process, but the manuscript could be saved and restored. He moved to thank the man, but he saw he had slumped down in a chair asleep. A well-deserved rest. Not bad. 1.8%. Wow, look at that. It just skyrocketed. Holy crap. You can only do much with a Siberian plan now. Oh, that's so sad. Scavenge for weapons, yeah. Yeah, military expansion. It's okay. It's, it's okay. Yeah, it's just okay. Not bad. We need more guns now, though. But we do have that 20 army XP, which is really nice. And we're exercising, too, so. Do we actually have planes here? Oh. I didn't realize we had planes. We could train them, but... Okay, we're going to train them. Nothing here yet. And we did have a successful raid, so we got to wait. Or, or maybe not. Um, oh, actually, just do Black Army again. Cross Norsk? Okay, we're going to cross Norsk then. The People's Apocalypse. A nation of writers, poets, and scholars. The University of Tomsk produced more manuscripts and manifestos than most people care to count, yet one piece, published anonymously, had begun to spread controversy far and wide throughout Siberia. The People's Apocalypse. Oh, if you, oh, actually, if you want to read about the rest of the People's Apocalypse, please go right ahead. I've read about this many times before, so... If you'd like to read this again, please go right ahead. An, an inaugural speech. President Lekachov had been convened both houses of the White Duma to his inaugural speech. The lower house was crowded, members of the House of Peers sitting on temporary chairs next to the colleagues of the House of Representatives. The din and chatter of the room began to ebb away as the president walked to his podium. Friends, colleagues, thank you for joining me in this inauguration of the December's Constitution, the first of the new republic. The government of the December's society sees many problems plaguing the nation. Some were inherited from the Soviet days. Others have grown from the mistakes made during the central Siberian government, and then in the days of the provisional government. Oh, god dang it, we're going to read him again. The chief among them is the state of the prison system. The number of po prisoners is exceedingly high. Many do not know what they are accused of or have been hastily given trials during the dark days of the provisional government. I, the president searched for his little words a little, I was a victim of the barbaric prison system during the Soviet days. Another moment of silence. The Republic cannot live if it decides to destroy the life of its citizens arbitrarily. I do not ask the nation to forgive criminals, but to spare the innocents from imprisonment, and to treat the guilty with compassion and with an eye to rehabilitation. Prison reforms will be one of the core aspects of this government's mandate. The other angle will be to help devote or develop the countryside. Our rural citizens have been left forgotten by successive governments. Their way of life is under the threat of urbanization and from the lure of industrial work. We need not cower from modernity. We equally do not need to forget our origins. Better rural infrastructure will help the city folk develop their businesses, while giving new opportunities to their fellow citizens in the countryside. This assembly will not always support this government's programs. I merely ask you to, ask, to do all your work as best you can and to follow your convictions with courage and dignity. We, hold, we all hold the keys to a better, brighter future for the Russian people. Thank you, President... Likachov. I'm sure I'm saying his name wrong, and some of you guys are screaming at me in the comments for to say his name right, but my apologies. Workers next. Growth, yes. And then, and then investments. Oh, that's not good. Cap, not... 80% is not good. Even if we did military austerity, that's not that much. 
Yeah, we gotta keep an eye on how much we're spending here. Even eight divisions. I'd rather make them bigger than do anything else, but the Petrov Salon Triumph of Stability. Although Anatoly Petrov was elated at his recent promotion to a corporal, it was just tempered by the victory of the Decembers in the Republic's recent election. The experience had been almost surreal, and had done little to uh, allay his earlier fears of division in the Republic. Huddled around a small radio with other soldiers, the several he was now ostensibly in charge of, he had heard both uh, the results as well as Lekajov's victory speech shortly thereafter, and the effect was immediate. Some of the men were elated, but others were severely, dis severely disappointed, and more than one argument had been broken out. In addition, the immediately expected letter from his mother arrived only two days later, expressing her contentment in the December's victory and hoping for continued stability within the Republic. She also alarmingly wrote of the negative receptions of the electoral result among Anatoly's father and sister. More letters would surely be coming from them as well. Before he had come to the army and based on the example of his family, he had thought that the political dispute could, even if vigorous, be sufficiently separated from the prison. That was what President Pasternak had always said to remember. Since his death, though, and increasingly, he was seeing the opposite. He was seeing discord and disagreement that continued far beyond time, location, or interaction where they initially occurred. Even those from he considered his peers the followers of Shostakovich. Everyone in his unit was saying that Lekachov intended to concentrate on fully restoring the Republic. And it only hoped that the inherently unifying nature of such a mission could act to oppose the trends he had seen, which weighed so heavily on his soul. Expansion, opportunities, and it approaches. Treasure. Nice. Nice. 66.66%. Ah, our lucky number. Alright, so with all this going on, working conditions, conditions, we don't really care about. Uh, power grid is looking pretty good. 2249. Increase the state GDP, we'll do it once. And they'll save our political power. As much as I want to. Ooh. 18% chance of military professionalism and societal development will begin to slowly improve. We do get 1,000 more manpower, but slowly improve is okay. Uh, we, you do get more weekly stability here. So that's like 10, actually 7 divided by that is about 10 ish. 10 ish. So about 10 times 2 is about 2% more stability. 2% eh, it's not much. Yeah, this is not bad to do. I like this one too. An entire production unit is pretty nice, but we got to keep the political power for the next stage of societal developments as well as just coring stuff. So we owe to Liberty. Balsam landscape. Ooh, increase GDP immediately is probably really good to do. But you get more stability and political power. Um, ooh. Ooh, but GDP. Let's do that first. The Balsam Landscape. The Balsam of Montaria was famous as a panthea in the ancient world, physician securing, scouring the land for this mystical uh, resin. The ancient medicus would have done better to look for the bigger picture, surrounded as they were by a pristine landscape. Russians in particular are healed by the vastness of nature around them. Their mind healed and strengthened by forests without end. Their body tended to by the bounties of the land, furnished food and shelter both through industry. And this real development thus must be carefully considered in this context. The peasant communities, if they are to be left alone, must be respected as much as possible. Nevertheless, we must all link up cities and industrial sites through new roads, as well as a find a proper balance to resource extraction. The December societies uniquely get qualified for this delicate work of balance. The December's three freedoms. Citizens, we've often been asked, what is it the December stand for? The name of our great salon alludes to our aims. The Decembers were men who ardently desired the end of serfdom in a modern Russia integrating the best idea of the West into Russian traditions. Not an end to the old Russia, but a rational continuation of it. The Russian people had seen their liberties eroded by tar Tsarism, and the heart of their tradition, the village community, is trampled by the dis diktats of uncaring noble landlords. Likewise, the modern December seek to ensure Russian freedom, this time from a different angle. The danger of industrialization. That's not to say that industry is a threat to Russian way of life. But like many other Western ideas, modern industry offers a great many things to the nation. However, it also brings with it threats. Chief among them are twin-headed beasts, destruction of nature, and the environment. The traditional co co cocoon in which Russian culture has grown, destruction of liberties by governments or corporate interests attempted to brutally optimize the pursuit of material goods. The December should stand for freedom. For citizens, freedom to enjoy the environment of your forefathers. Freedom to earn a living decently without industrial serfdom. Forward and from foreign tyrants who seek to destroy our republic. As long as one of us still stands, we shall fight to defend these, th these three freedoms for you. Introduction to the December's manifesto written by President Lekachov. A new spin on an old idea. Now we've got quite a bit of political power, but... As we one more focus after we before we end this episode, and we did external investment, which is pretty nice. Soviet power grids would be pretty good too. Oh, I want to do that, but we're gonna save our PP for now. We're looking okay here, and we do want to spend more political power for this legacy of the Siberian plan. Oh, how bad are we looking for guns? We're actually looking really good on guns. Wow. And after that one, let's see the open road, more GDP, more debt though. Few remove few regulations. Now get some regulations. Harvest industry. Ooh, that's not even bad. A path uh, less of Siberiask. Ooh, business taxes would increase by two point five percent. Increases the liquid reserves, increases our GDP, and more growth. But owe to liberty. 
greatly increases our interest and stuff like that. Ooh. Poverty will begin to slowly improve as well. Oh my goodness. Growth will increase by 1%, but more inflation goes up. Taxes go down, increase our liquid reserves. The duty of the state, not bad. Academic base begins to improve, and a new renaissance, man. Oh my goodness. Administrative efficiency begins to improve. Trump increases the voting turnout by 6%, or Lamentations of the Warlords, which is not bad, but we already have maxed out stability. Incarceration with rehabilitation, not bad either. It gets some political power, more growth, but more inflation, well, quite a bit more inflation. Increases GDP, though. More debt, bureaucrats from the guards. Oh my gosh, the market misery. Oh, poverty will begin to improve. Not slowly improve, but improve. Ooh. Oh my goodness, I want to do all this stuff as fast as possible. Honestly, the center route seems like it's going to take the longest, and it seems okay. But expertise is still going to improve as well. God dang it. I think what we're going to do, we'll go down this route first. Yeah, we get a, pretty much a mixture of everything. So let's finish the episode by reading the Ode of Liberty. The atom of the Russian civilization is its citizens, rich or poor. The great force that allows him or her to associate to others is liberty. The liberty to join labor with others. The liberty to seek a better future. The liberty to try new things. Our December's forebears fought to keep Russians free from Napoleon's foreign tyranny. Then they fought unsuccessfully to free them from the bondage of serfdoms. The freedom of our precursors sought was not the nihilistic freedoms of anarchism and socialism. Rather, it was a simple, honest freedom to explore the natural order of things. Likewise, the freedom we seek to impart on the people should not give them the ability to rob other citizens of their freedoms. Free enterprise needs not be a pathway to enslaving industrial workers anew, just as it needed not be cause to insert the Russian peasant. Our December's government shall thus protect freedom within the bounds of decency and of charity and values. So important to the Russian people. But if you enjoyed today's episode, leave a like, subscribe if you're new, check out my Discord link in the description below if you haven't already, and I'll see you tomorrow as we shall hopefully begin reuniting Central Siberia. Thanks for watching. Have a great, tremendous Tomsk rest of your day.